so this is more of an, an informal chat, I guess. Uh, talking about game jams. Uh, so we're the evangelists for EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And you're all very lucky that we're all in the same room. It's normally like once every six months yeah. uh, we get together. Uh, so yeah, it's like. So either the stars have aligned and something good will happen, or something bad will happen. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's two outcomes. Hopefully it'll be good. Yeah. I think it'll be good. Um, so this is going to be a half an hour talk, tips and tricks about game jams. Um, it's not actually that specifically about Unity. This is, I'm saying this just before we all get fired, um, <laughs> because we all work at Unity. And, uh, but there'll be some little bits and pieces here and there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we are Joe Robbins. Yep. <laughs> and that's obviously me, um, before I grew my hair and had a beard. Um, uh, just to explain this whole concept, we, we wanted to have some pictures of ourselves up so you could see who we were. Um, we decided that we'd Google our names and find the first picture that wasn't us uh, on Google. So I don't know who that guy is. He might be a serial killer, but it's, <laughs> that's ben, me anyway. That's Josh Naylor in the middle, who's a famous Miami baseball player. Um, Miami? Unfortunately, more famous than Josh here, yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah. And I don't know who I am, but uh, <laughs> I've clearly aged a couple of years, yeah. Um, so yeah, game jams. So out of interest, put your hand up if you've taken part in a game jam. Wow, okay, okay cool. Put your hand up if you haven't. Boo. <laughs> put your hand up if you're looking for like the local strawberry jam conference and thought this <laughs> might be something relevant. Jam making. Okay, Not everyone in the room is, is in the right location. Um, so game jams is quite a big part of uh, creating games, partly because a lot of the elements of a game jam, a lot of things you learn and lessons and rules, um, you can then extrapolate and multiply for making bigger games, um, as we'll go through through these slides. Um, so... Yeah, I think like, the thing with game jams is that they're kind of intrinsically... Intrinsically? They're just directly <laughs> linked with Unity in a lot of ways. I think a lot of the, the early movement of game jams occurring with the things like the Nordic game jam and all of the stuff in the early global game jam, it was very much in time. We, I think Unity was just around at just the right time to be like a really helpful tool to be able to make a game really quickly and iterate on it and, uh, and test things quickly. So we've kind of... We've kind of grown up a little bit with game jams, so it's kind of a, a match made in heaven to some degree. Um, and I think also yeah. each of us have taken part in hundreds of game jams, and every bad thing that we're going to highlight that you shouldn't <laughs> do, we've all probably done. So hopefully we can say, we did all these things, we fucked up in the, sorry, we messed up in these <laughs> ways. Um, and then hopefully if you haven't taken part in a game jam, you're like, okay, cool, you can kind of begin it kind of thing. Because there's a lot of things you can do wrong, there's a lot of things you can do right. So the first point to make is kind of there's different jams. Everyone assumes by a game jam that you have either 24 hours or 48 hours, which isn't actually true. It is true for most of them, though. So you have themes jams, such as Ludum Dare, Global Game Jam, and what would Molly do? <laughs> Put your hand up if you knew that game jam. I knew Molly do. OK, I better for ask first. Put your hand up if you're Peter Molyneux. Put your hand up if you're Peter Molyneux. <laughs> ah, the okay. second one. If so it, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the Molly Jew was a really awesome one, and it kind of evolved out of um, basically someone on Twitter who was pretending to be Peter Molyneux, Peter Molyneux the second, and he'd just come up with inspirational ideas for, for games that were just out of this world and a little bit wild and a bit funny. And then after one of the GDCs, uh, or is it maybe during a GDC a few years back now, um, the suggestion came round that we make it into a into a game jam based on the tweets of uh, Molly Jew the second. It's ridiculous game themes, uh, and yeah, that was one that we picked up on at Unity, and we uh, you know we got in contact, and that was back in the day when you couldn't get Unity for free. So we arranged for trial licenses for everything, and started doing some sponsorship stuff. So there was T-shirts printed and all this kind of stuff, and it all just came out of nowhere really. But it ended up being a really hilarious game jam, and it's one that's continued. Uh, and yeah and produced a lot of hilarious results as well. Yeah, that some cube game came out of it? Some <laughs> yeah. every now and the again? Cube. Um, <laughs> so partly with the theme is there is a theme delivered, and then you have to make a game based on the theme. And you normally don't have control what the theme is. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that in a second. So for example, Ludum Dare, everyone votes for the theme, and people try to vote potato as the theme every, every time, or goat. <laughs> Um, it never makes it, but people still put goats as bosses or potatoes as the collectible item, which is quite fun. 
Um, you also have longer time jams. So these are kind of ones like one game a month or hashtag one GAM for anyone born in the last sort of 15 years, um, where you basically set yourself um, to make a game within a month and then release it on a website. So this is a very good element because put your hand up if you have started making a game you've always wanted to make and you've absolutely loved it. No one's started to make a game that you've loved. Put your hand up if you started making a game. <laughs> okay. Keep your hand up if you finished making that game. Okay, there's a some people. So one game a month kind of teaches you to set your limit. At the end of the month, I will ship this game, which is actually kind of like the, the, the last 10% is the 90% of development time. One game a month gets you to actually kind of set a deadline. There's so many indies I speak to who have said, oh, it'll come out next month. And then, uh, no, actually like two months from now, and then four years later, it's, it's going to be coming out. And this can kind of teach you to set that. Yeah. Um, there's also Game of Week, which is done by Adriel Wallach. Is she here? No, she's not here. Oh, OK. So she, um, Adriel Wallach set herself a task, not maps. Um, Adriel Wallach set herself a task to make a game every single week for a whole year. So she made 52 games in one year. And then she released it at the end of the week and then blogged about what went right and what went wrong. So that way she could try all sorts of things, text adventure games, platformers, and all sorts of things, and then release them. I mean, the games are quite simple because, again, you only have a week, but she learned quite a lot in that sort of process, and that was like a self-set longer, um, longer jam. Yeah, I think something about the, that longer form that was really interesting is the fact that if you've got 48 hours, you don't really have time to write blog posts. You don't have time to you know, analyze what went well and what didn't. But when you've got a longer period of time, not only do you have the time to, you know, to discuss what it was that you went well and, and put stuff out there, but there's this kind of level of accountability involved. So in order to continue doing this one game a month thing, there was this kind of, well, I've, you know, I've started now, and if I don't do it now, there's all these people that will be like, where's your one game a month, or where's your one game a week? So there's this level, that level of accountability can really help you know, push you over that, any barriers that you come across in terms of getting you know, motivated to finish something or try something. So it's a fascinating read. I'd highly recommend checking out the blog, because some, you know, some of them are like, I really didn't have time this week, but I, you know, I got this out. Or some some weeks are really fantastic and you know really inspired. So it's a uh, it's pretty cool. Sorry, yeah. I moved to the next slide because we're running out of time, and oh, yeah, I'm yeah. kind of doing the Oscars playoff thing, but in a <laughs> more of a passive-aggressive British way. Um, so post jam release. So a lot of people will take your their jam. I probably say like 99% of people won't. They'll say, they'll yeah. always say, "Oh, I work on my game after the jam," and that never happened. But there's actually some things that have come from jam. So for example, Bosa Studios. Um, they basically worked on Surgeon Simulator in a 48-hour jam. Hopefully, people here know that game. Yeah, yeah. OK, cool. So they worked in the 48 hours, released it online. It was uh, a big hit in just about everything, in press, downloads. So then they were set 48, the same team, 48 days to make kind of the proper one and release it on Steam. And games like Super Hot, which was done in 7D FPS, we had to make a first-person shooter in seven days. Um, we're all born from game jams. It was a very quick turnaround, and then they saw what went wrong, what went right, and then were able to take those games and adapt them. Um, then you have location jams, which is kind of the novelty of jamming in a completely ridiculous place. So normally, game jams either take place in like a school or a studio or a rented place. Um, this one, again, organized by Adriel, so you, uh, where you jam on a train kind of three days before GDC. So you spend all three days awake on a train, no shower for three days, then you do GDC. And anyone who's been to GDC, it's almost like <laughs> multiplying how dirty you are. Um, but the novelty of being on a train and traveling that fast and everyone being in that enclosed location then adds to it. Um, although sort of more close to home, uh, in Europe, we, there's Splash Jam, which took place earlier this year, where you basically jammed on a boat in the Arctic Circle and uh, for three days. There was zero Wi-Fi. Um, actually, the only Wi-Fi was when we sort of like uh, came to close to a city, but then everyone, all 200 people then jumped on the Wi-Fi and then no one could use it. So the fact that there was no Wi-Fi contributed to it in that you could, um, you know, like you had to use the utilities that you had there. You had to say, oh, I need artwork. I can't just download it from Google. I have to actually speak to human beings and see if they have that artwork or they can create it for us. So there's 200 people being made to stand for the 30th photo freezing cold. And Josh is holding a cup of tea on the far right. Yeah, that, which, that went cold in about 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. so cold tea. Um, limitations. This is kind of, I'd say, the main point of a game jam. Um, mm. For example, time. This is my algorithm. Um, that's Polish, not Polish. <laughs> um, 
as someone else thought. So what I try to do with game jams is I take the time, say 20, let's say 24 hours. I try to get it at least to a playable state. So let's say it's a platform where you have to jump and collect things and jump on enemies' heads, like Mario. Um, I would at least try to get the main, sorry, uh, at least try to get the main sort of concepts and the main mechanics done and working by 12 hours in. So it's at least of a playable. I mean, it may look shit or may look bad, and the art might not be in there. There may be no UI or menus and stuff, but I try to at least get it playable. Then polish or polish um, the last half of the game jam. So spend the next half of it, you know, actually refining it and actually making it to a playable thing. I mean, if you end the game jam with a very, very small, very tight polished thing, like Surgeon Sim was one level in the game jam. They just created one level and did it really, really well, and one mechanic and did it really, really well. Um, that's better than having kind of bits of a bigger game that don't really work or don't really fit together. Um, yeah. yeah. Getting that one mechanic playable as soon as possible uh, and finding out if it's even remotely fun is really critical. So get that, even if you have to throw a few concepts away because they just weren't being fun, as soon as you find that one little nugget of fun, cling to it and make that your focus because it can so be very easy to get distracted with uh, you know, like long, longer form things in all different directions, but always keep that little nugget. Keep it. So find the Polish time. nugget of fun. Yeah. And you also find cool. a lot of people as well, because they have so little time, they think of one idea and like, yep, yeah, let's do that straight away. And then they find out 10 hours later, and that was a very bad idea. <laughs> so yeah. just think of a lot of ideas beforehand and then decide on one of those or a multiple of those. Uh, external limits. So kind of this is stuff set by other people, unless you're organizing the game jam, in which case you can break your own rules. But this is things such as the game jam is 24 hours. That's the theme. That's the external limit set. Or the theme is blah or there's no sleeping at the location. These are all limitations set by other people that you fit into. This is quite typical in the game studio. You know, I, we have to ship by this day because this platform's being released, or we have to release DLC for this thing because we've already said we would, and things like that. But you can also have um, self-limits. So for example, I'm going to make a game in 24 hours. I've never made a platform before. I'm going to make a 2D platformer, or I want to be an artist, or I want to make a game just by myself because in my day job, um, or in the past, I've always made games with like 200, 300 person teams. Let's try something else. You can actually have your external limits, which are great because they're like hard limits, hard rules. And then you have your own rules, which you could break as well, which is quite fun. Like sometimes, I think I try to make a 2D platform and just turn it into a 3D one in the middle of the process. And that I then learned how to take 2D and then kind of bake it to 3D, which is quite cool. The theme as well. So who took part in Global Game Jam? OK, so the recent global game, well, recent, uh, like January, um, was Ritual. So the theme is also a limitation in that you have to fit your game or fit your thing that you're creating into this um, theme. So for example, you can take this literally. So lots of people, I went to Norway to do this jam. Lots of people were just basically making sacrifice games. You have to sacrifice things to a ritual. OK? Some people took it like really abstract. So technically, brushing your teeth every day is a ritual. So they had to do a game where you had to brush your teeth accurately the same way every day. So you can take the theme exactly what you're going to make, or you could kind of make it uh, a bit more abstract. Obviously, not too crazy, like uh, an abstract. It can breed a lot of creativity, though. Like if someone just says, make a game, you could have a million exactly, ideas. Yeah. But if someone says, make a game about an egg, like that can create a lot of creativity around that subject. It doesn't have to be the exact egg. It could be something abstract, like, like we'll see. Exactly, yeah. I think the, the, the whole thing of limitation is the fact that it allows you to focus creatively. So you have, uh, you have these limitations, whether they're, you know, they're like, an, like a theme or a ritual, but even like technology-wise, like if you have like a, a guy who's really good at like low poly art and he can hammer it out really quickly, uh, it's great to take advantage of that and use that as a limiting factor, like, you know, set some really obscure things, like we're not going to use textures in this game and, and this kind of stuff, because that can really help narrow your focus and actually let you, uh, let you be quite, quite creative in quite a limited space. Uh, Wi-Fi. So I had to get a traffic jam pun in there somehow. <laughs> and one person found it funny. Thank you, dude. You get a free Unity t-shirt. Oh, you've already been given one, but yeah, there. Um, <laughs> I think there's some water I could give, yeah. Um, so this is an accurate representation of Wi-Fi at a game jam. The streets being the Wi-Fi, the, the cars being the people trying to access it. So that in itself is a limitation. If, uh, put your hand up if you basically use Google every day to Google for help or suggestions or things. 
best game development tool out there. Yeah, best game, <laughs> other than Unity, yeah, it's the best game <laughs> development tool ever. So don't rely on Wi-Fi being amazing. And there's some points later on we'll make, but Wi-Fi is almost guaranteed to be pretty terrible. Oh, on the Splash Jam, there was zero Wi-Fi. So it wasn't even like a page would load in five minutes. There was just a page wouldn't load. So that was a whole bunch of interesting things where people turned up without actually installing anything beforehand. There was, an, there was another like, similar one in terms of like, the hardware re, re, like, restraints that you have with, the, with regards to limitation as well, and that was the, the battery jam, which I thought was a fantastic concept where you only have one full charge of your laptop battery <laughs> in order to make the game. So, you know, close the, close the <laughs> lid and write code down on paper and then turn it on and turn it on. That was a, that was a really cool idea. Can't do any baking with that. No, yeah, no <laughs> lime mask. <laughs> and at the 5% point, everything's starting to get really chuggish. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so the audio guy girl that's at the Game Jam is a limitation, because I guarantee, I think at Nordic Game Jam, there's like one audio person for 100 people taking part. Or Basically, the audio people are gold dust, and they actually shuffle, uh, shuffle around uh, different uh, teams actually creating audio. So if you have a friend who's an audio person, invite them to the Game Jam, whether they make games or not, because they will be gold dust. Um, there was a Game Jam in London uh, at Microsoft Modern Jargo. It was like kind of a pop-up place Microsoft set. There was like 30 teams, and one audio guy turned up and worked on all 30 projects. So he released 30 games in 24 hours, <laughs> and every one he just said, oh, just put like my credits and my email there. And he basically just goes to the Game Jams and just pimps his name out, because he's the only one that goes to it. So he's, he released 30 games in 24 hours, which is more than most people released in their life. Yeah. So um, that, goes to, that goes to show for, like, I think the thing with, with with anyone who's kind of a little bit outside of the industry as well. I mean, obviously, you have audio people that are directly related to the industry, but I, in my experience, at least, working with people that have no experience whatsoever in games can be one of the most creative and interesting atmospheres to work in because they come in with no pre preconceived ideas, and it's up to you to kind of, like, work with them in their knowledge because everyone, everyone's obviously got completely different backgrounds, and, and that can be some of the, yeah, the, the best stuff in my experience. Yeah, I've worked with like writers and journalists and graphic designers who have nothing to do with games yeah. in their normal life, but they just found an interest and they come along and they really loved it because it gives like a fresh new uh, ideas. It's really nice. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go through these slides in about four seconds a slide. Because got like 100 <laughs> to go. No, um, so, you, so there's kind of two polarizing things there. So use what you're comfortable with. You know, if you know uh, Unity, Blender, Audacity, and Photoshop. If you go to a game jam, you already bring that knowledge beforehand. You're not starting from scratch. Um, or try something completely new. Now, the, the good side of try something completely new is you have 24 hours to try something new. You're not going to waste a six-month thing learning something just to realize it didn't work. You can hash things out very, very quickly. So you can choose one or the other. But I'd say if you come with comfortable uh, skills in a certain tech, um, generally go for more complex stuff. If you're trying something new, don't try to, oh, I'm going to use this platform to make uh, Minecraft, right? Minecraft's actually quite a complex game, you know, and you're also learning stuff on top. There's a lot of overhead to that. Um, people? Mm. So this is the slowest GIF of all time, <laughs> so we have to watch it out. Also, it's a Space Jam pun. Either people, most of the people here Weak. are too young to know Space Jam, but yeah, uh, probably. Weak puns. Here we go. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> I can be of some assistance. Uh, yeah, so team formation. So I think every single game jam I've been to, uh, there's many, many, many over the years. Yep, uh, many, many, many over the years. There's always a team formation. So if you are by yourself and you go and you're a lone programmer or a lone artist or a lone audio person, or you've never made a game before and you just want to go along, there will always be a team formation of all the people who, oh, we need an artist or we need a programmer or Something like that. So go in and dress up as Bill Murray and ask if you can be of some assistance. Um, it's really important as well to meet new people as well. A lot of people just come with their friends, sit down, make a game, and then say this is our game, and then leave. The whole idea is meant you, you go meet some new people, talk about games, talk about game making, and make some new friends, and then go away, and then you'll see them again. And that's and what this, yeah, this, uh, this slide up here is talking more about the kind of some, some people go in with the, like, the notion that having more people in the team is going to be helpful, but we, I guess we like, collectively think that maybe a group of maybe three, four, maybe even two people can be just a really, a really good dynamic because you've got enough people to focus on separate areas. So yeah, you know, more people equals more input, more content, and more ideas, but it, more people does not mean that you're going to develop a game faster, necessarily. It, you know? like if you have 50 people who've never met 
each other before and you form a team, and you're maybe the best people ever, but that's 50 more times input, that's 50 more, con 50 more content, yeah. 50 more, but then that doesn't necessarily mean the game would be faster. I've been to game jams where like a team of 30s formed who've never met before, <laughs> and in 48 hours you have to learn how to work with other people, how to set up source control for all these people in their backgrounds, all the art styles, and you just see this kind of Frankenstein about 10 different art styles in one game, yeah. which, is, which is garbage. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So 10, good. oh yeah, sorry. 10 programmers plus one artist is generally no, um, because that, those programmers will basically write tons and tons of code, and this one art, poor artist can be in the corner just sweating, trying to catch up with it. You want a mostly even ratio, so have art, say, let's say like three artists, two programmers, maybe an audio person or audio person for hire or something like that. Kind of generally have a good ratio between people, otherwise you kind of create a funnel at one point. If there's 10 artists and one programmer, that's 10 times more art than the programmer is going to have to handle. And then he'll, he or she will have to implement 50 characters or something insane. In, it, in itself, the team that you're with is a limitation as well, to some degree. Like, you know, if you've got, like, if you've got three programmers and that's all you've got, just you know, do programmer art and enjoy it. The, uh, it's, it's very much a case of getting the right atmosphere uh, and the right environment to uh, to talk in and have your, you know, to do a jamming. And we talk a little bit about that later on. But, People uh, with different skills as well have a busy at different times. So your designers will be very busy early on getting the core concepts. Mm -hmm. The artists will be busy maybe midway through and the programmers can be busy all the way through and especially <laughs> at the end fixing everything and getting everything polished. Yeah. So a lot of people just stick to their own teams as well. But if your artist's not busy, say, hey, why don't you go see if anyone needs some 2D art? Or if your audio guy, like, hey, why don't you go see if another team is busy? See if they need help. It's all about just sharing content and being friendly with everyone rather than just sticking to your own team. Okay. Great. We have about 4,000 slides remaining <laughs> and five Excellent. minutes, so we'll see how this goes. So yeah, be sociable. <laughs> Three words for each slide. Three words. Yeah, let's do it. So this is, this is a limitation in itself, a <laughs> self-limitation. And the external limitation of, of how long the talk is. So actually, this is a mini game jam. Um, okay. Go. So what's your three words? For this one? Yeah. Uh, Get meet, free stuff. Meet cool people. Meet cool, OK. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Technology, technology, Unity, technology. Um, so there's free, OK, I have to talk a bit more about <laughs> it. So there's free and simple software. So stuff like Audacity or CFXR, SFXR. So what's cheering? Did you build either of those tools? Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> They've saved your life in the past. <laughs> <laughs> so for example, with CFXR, um, basically it generates 8-bit uh, sounds automatically for you that's generated so you don't have to pay for a license or anything like that. So if I click jump, I just made 10 jump sound effects, right? Automatically generated. So CFX is very good for getting the little juicy beep or jumps or like. Just getting some initial feedback in for your, for your game as well. It can be really handy, like adding just a little explosion sound effect when something dies just really you know, adds that level of feedback that you don't get normally. So it's handy even just for placeholder stuff when you're working on regular projects. Um, there's also this guy called Kenny or Keeney. Does anyone know this guy? Asset so his, Jesus. His, yeah, nickname's Asset Jesus, because he basically comes up with all these packs and just releases them completely for free. Creator Commons open. He likes it if you put thanks Kenny or uh, thanks Asset Jesus. But <laughs> he just creates all these modular packs that are very optimized and very high detail. So for example, here you've got 3D tiles. And if you look at the sample, like you just build stuff. You can just download the pack and use that completely free. And it's, it's awesome. Also, send him what you build, because he likes seeing that and collecting it. Um, free sound as well, you have to make an account, but you can basically type in, let's say, laser. Um, and then now you can go through and... Okay. Yeah, you can go through and preview the sounds and download them. They do require a credit, though. Um, open game art as well, you can type in uh, dog. Yeah, you can search for stuff. And then you can download <laughs> lots of different types of dog. Most of these are open source, but some of them you'll have to do like little credits and stuff. Uh, ooh, crumbs, how long Let, do we have? Let's go, Basically, let's go. No time. Two and a half minutes. Uh, bring all your tech. Don't like turn no. up. I want to make a game with eight Xbox controllers, but you don't bring eight Xbox controllers. It's Prepare beforehand <laughs> would be the thing. Yeah, get all your technology lined up. And don't worry if it's rough. Um, 
don't worry if it's rough. That's more than, OK, you broke your self-limitation, so yeah. Um, so like Unity, you built at iOS, seven warnings, but build succeeded, which is quite a, a frequent thing to do. Don't worry if your code is really hacky or messy as long as it builds in the game jam. It's generally fine. As long as it works, you can go back. Building to mobile, but that's kind of an obvious three word. Unity Cloud Build is actually yeah. probably a better one. So building to mobile takes a long time. Cloud Build allows you to commit your uh, project, and then it's built in the cloud, and it sends you an email. Or I did a game jam, and I basically, whenever I built the game to iOS, I just get up and go have a walk and chat to people. And by the time I came back, it was already built and running on the device. So I actually use build times as a as mini breaks. Um, cool. Use source control of some kind. Yeah. Environment. Environment. <laughs> this one's this one's really important. And it's one that's often missed. Is You've got all the technology, you've got a cool team, you've got a good way of collaborating and working with each other. But actually, having a good environment to work in is so important. Like making sure that you've got food that's helped, like there, and all this kind of stuff. Make sure the environment that everyone, you know, it's a very creative environment, that everyone's talking and everything's, everything's good. Nothing worse than like a tense game jam. Um, but there's, there's one key thing about the environment that I would kind of talk about, and it relates to a picture of John Cleese, which. Um, May as well skip to that one. This is good enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's also good to say at Brick, so many people just try and force everything through all at the same time and their mind gets messed up. How many times did we go in the sauna or jacuzzi when we was on the uh, oh, so splash and, jam? And because splash we just need jam, that break we, and that time to relax. We set a limit of like every like three or four hours, we'd uh, take a break and go to the sauna and uh, talk about our game away from a computer, and then we come back chilled and really zen, and then we get yeah. to like actually finish the game and go back four hours later. This one's a bit of a random one, but it was one that I spoke with Alex Charles about earlier, and it's something that we, we'd both seen this video separately. It's a talk by John Cleese about creativity and about the open uh, mode and the closed mode. Uh, I'd highly recommend that anyone doing a game jam checks that out beforehand and sends it to all the people that they're going to uh, work on a team with because it's such a fantastic talk about being creative and it applies both to game jams but just to development in general. It's an awesome, awesome talk and it's hilarious because it's John Cleese. Um, this is not food and fuel uh, for uh, game jams. A lot of people just eat loads of burgers and pizzas and things. You should really be eating really healthy things. And that's just a general life advice. So <laughs> yeah. you come to learn about game jams and go away with life advice. This is uh, don't healthy. starve. That's also a very good piece of advice in, for game jams and life. Uh, I've seen been to some game jams. People just don't eat for 48 hours. And you're like, what are you doing to yourself? You're basically going to bash your head on the keyboard like that other guy or um, in the GIF. Experiment. So. Um, Play around with new mechanics. So for example, uh, on the boat, so this is me. I'd never met that guy before. Um, and I basically made a game where you have to throw your iPad in the air and catch it. And the higher you throw it, the more points you get. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if anyone's made a game like this. If not, I'm going to use 24 hours to try and make a game where you have to physically throw your iPad in the air to get points. Um, and this is how I tested it. And this guy just turned around to me and said, what the hell are you making? Um, I'd never met him before, and now we're really good friends. So from that, we were able to, you know, Connect. So try new mechanics. You have 24 hours to play around with things. Like Surgeon Simulator was a completely physics-driven game. You know, they had 24 hours, and they were able to play around with it. Um, new technology. So try and learn new things, but warning, there's like a difficulty curve. So I had to build a difficulty. I had to find a difficulty curve. And the Wi-Fi was kind of iffy in the hotel, so I just used Unity to generate the, the difficulty curve. Um, so what you can see here is, let's say you never made a VR game before, and you have an Oculus. You still got to learn how the Oculus works, how to set it up, the API, and then that's an extra thing that you have to learn in the middle of making a game. So either learn the stuff beforehand. I mean, do use new technologies, but learn it beforehand, or be aware that you may spend a quarter of your jam actually understanding how the API for the thingy works. And here is um, basically me every time I open like a 3D modeling software. John Travolta looking around. Also in Amsterdam, so it's kind of a fitting state for John Travolta to be in. Um, so yeah. Be prepared to learn crazy and complex interfaces such as uh, this. I'd say most of the time, if you're using a new technology, go with a mechanic that you know. And then if you're going for a new crazy mechanic, go with some technology that you do know. So yeah. balance it out. Yeah. Push yourself. That's a good Push yourself. Push yourself. Uh, yeah, that's two words, so yeah. <laughs> Push um, yourself more. <laughs> learn. Um, so let's say, for example, you never made a pixel art game before. Go to the game jam and work with a pixel artist. And then that way, you can then understand their workflow and concept. It, within 24 hours or 48 hours, you can learn an entire sort of workflow and working with another person without having to dedicate four months and then realizing, I hate pixel art or I love pixel art. You can, in 24 hours, have on your, it's basically a mini self crash course in how to learn a, a certain thing. 
And the key takeaway is you can't fail. Even if you go to a game jam and completely mess it all up and the game completely crashes and burns and you hate the rest of your team and you've eaten no fruit and you, you, you're starved and uh, everything's gone completely wrong, you then learn not to do those things again. So it is a learn in 24 hours you can learn some big lessons, not only just for making games, but also then extrapolate that to bigger um, bigger projects and things. So yeah. you can't so this is an accidental fitting in a limitation. So because we've failed so many times, we've not failed because we can't fail. Yeah. What? There you go. The only you way can tell you can he's an evangelist, right? You could, yeah. probably, you, could probably, you could probably fail if you if you decided you know you ended up starving to death or something. Then then you've kind of got a <laughs> finite end of failure. But generally, anything that anything that happens in a game jam, whether it's good or bad, you should never take it as a as a negative experience and not continue to jam because there is times when you'll have a really crummy team. I had a jam relatively recently and it was a really bad team. But I've been to also jams that have completely changed my entire perspective on you know, being creative and creating games. So don't give up if you've had a bad experience at a jam. Work out what it was that made it bad and, and learn from that. <laughs> <laughs>